the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, also known as the Church of the Resurrection, sits in the middle of the old city of Jerusalem. Within its large compound, it contains two of the holiest of Christian holy sites, only meters from one another. The traditional site of Jesus' crucifixion, the hill of Golgotha, now an ornate altar, and the traditional site of Jesus' tomb and burial, now only, only some remains of rock enclosed within a small chapel. Over a million pilgrims visit the Holy Sepulchre each year, and the tradition for these holy sites goes back at least to the 4th century. It's regarded as unknowable, but historically plausible. This site celebrates central events of Christian faith. Jesus' death, Jesus' burial, Jesus' resurrection, and the stories and beliefs that are shared in common by Christians of all denominations, nationalities, and political leanings. So naturally, this church is the subject of much chaos and disunity. The care and use of the church has been maintained for several centuries by six Christian groups. The Roman Catholics, the Greek Orthodox and the Armenian churches, and to a lesser extent, the Coptic, Ethiopian, and Syrian Orthodox churches. A complex set of rules carves up the area into sections for each group, and some are shared in common and some are disputed. And the rules also determine access and transit rights of various groups through other parts of the building at different times of day in order to hold their mass services. Over the years, arguments, fistfights, and even stone throwing have flared up over such mundane trespasses like one of the groups sweeping the wrong step. Perceived as an attempt to gain the care and control of just a few more inches of the building. Or in 2002, an old monk from one sect moving his chair on the roof into the shade of a tree a few feet over the line into an area belonging to a different sect. Badly needed repairs and renovations have been delayed or foregone due to lack of cooperation between the groups. And in one of the more comical examples of disunity, there is a so-called immovable ladder. It's a simple wooden frame that has sat atop an exterior wall on the second floor for over 200 years, leading to nowhere. The ladder was apparently placed there in the 1800s by a member of an unknown sect, and no one has dared to move it since, given that any changes to the property without the permission of the other groups could upset the status quo and lead to more violence. Now, to my best understanding, very little of the conflict over the church has to do with substantive disagreement. All the groups value this site and want to see it maintained for pilgrims. All the groups are composed primarily of Palestinian Christians who have broad agreement on political matters in the region. They're not arguing over the meaning of Jesus' death and resurrection, or who Jesus died for, or any other theological concern. Rather, they're quarreling to preserve themselves, to control their own little piece of Christian history, to have a space to do things exactly their way. Egoistic quibbles. Now, it's easy to look at someone else and see this problem, and this is not to say that there may not be real reasons for the Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox churches to have suspicions of one another. Old hurts die hard. Old grudges can be carried in our bodies for generations. Fundamental differences do exist between these groups. But when it comes to this church, they're not talking about the real differences. They're talking about whether an old monk should be able to sit in the shade. Now, it appears to be a similar dynamic that the Apostle Paul is criticizing in 
a letter to the Corinthians as he addresses the quarrels and dissensions at the church in Corinth. Apparently, factions within the church had begun to get hung up on their allegiance to various leaders. Some said, I belong to Paul, and some, I belong to Apollos, and others, I belong to Cephas, the Aramaic name for the disciple Peter. And others, perhaps trying to play it like they were above all the divisions, but really just creating another one, I belong to Christ. As best we can tell, just like the factions in the Holy Land, they weren't arguing over matters of big theological substance. It wasn't as though the Apollos group believed you had to earn God's favor, while Paul said God bestowed it freely. It wasn't as though the Christ faction said that people of all social statures and abilities were welcome in the church and the Cephas folks wanted to keep the widows out. No, the factions seemed to have been a matter of style, of ego, of in-group. Apollos is described elsewhere as one who was learned and polished and wise, while Paul described himself more as basic and foolish sounding in the eyes of the intellectual world. So I don't know, maybe the Apollos folks wanted to use the best scholarship and the most orderly procedures in their church. While Paul contingent was cool with informal conversation and whatever the first century Greek equivalent of rock music was. Or maybe the Cephas group thought that the kids should have their own separate space while the Christ group thought everyone should worship in the same area together. Or maybe they loaded the communion dishware into the dishwasher differently or disagreed about whether widows or orphans should be first in line for financial assistance. Whatever the specifics, each faction was convinced that they knew better. Theirs was the true understanding, the best way, the most up-to-date knowledge. But as Paul tells them elsewhere, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. They had become preoccupied with being right over being together. They had put self-righteous, banner-waving which group they were in, ahead of love. In the end, Paul reminds them, Paul and Apollos are nothing. Only God who makes things grow. In light of these catty arguments, Paul referred to the, to the Christians at Corinth as spiritual babies, infants in Christ, because they were so lacking in the basics, like loving one another, that they were not ready to chew on spiritual questions of tougher substance. And Paul called them to grow up, to be in agreement, to have no divisions among them, to be knit together. Paul called them to unity. Now I confess that the concept of unity makes me skeptical. As an American in 2022, it is hard not to be skeptical of unity. On the one hand, it doesn't seem possible when we look at our political life or the state of Christianity in our nation or even our extended families. And on the other hand, too often, calls for unity seem to function as calls to silence dissenting voices. Let's just get along, folks say and those who speak up about their hurt are called divisive. Racial justice activists, for example. And so I want to be clear, we know from other parts of the Bible that Christians are not called to settle for a cheap and easy peace. Jesus did plenty of arguing with religious leaders, especially when compassion and mercy were at stake. The same Paul who called for unity here was ready to argue over matters that he considered essential to following Jesus. When some early church leaders had hesitations about including non-Jewish Gentiles in the church and what rules they should have to follow and how high the bar should be set for them, like, did they have to get circumcised? Paul argued and debated and even opposed to the most highly respected leader, Peter, and prayed and prayed 
to ensure that God's grace should be available to all without undue burden. I'll venture to say that in today's church, in today's world, when there are barriers in extending God's grace to all, it may be worth being a little divisive. But these days, in the midst of a petty grievance culture not so unlike the Corinthian church, it seems easy to take that one step too far, to cross the line from standing up for justice and veer into the realm of self-righteousness. So for all of us who have ever engaged in a petty argument on social media or in the church or the workplace or at home, maybe Paul's words offer a call to let our egos go a little, to seek peace where we can. In another of his letters, Paul calls the church in Ephesus, the Ephesians, to bear with one another in love making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I like that phrasing for what the call to unity means, bearing with one another in love. It might be veering from Merriam-Webster a little, or veering from the traditional image of unity as two flames coming together in one candle, now indistinguishable from one another, but what if it's as good a definition of unity as we can live into today? Bearing with one another in love. What if unity at its deepest core really means loving one another? Not agreeing with one another on everything, not silencing our hurts and concerns to appear indistinguishable, but knowing when it's time to put our supposed best way of doing things aside and bear with one another in love. As Paul reminds us, even our best speech and knowledge and mission and efforts are nothing without love. So to take that to my own heart, I wonder, maybe I should stop my tacit assumptions that I will find friends and allies and mission and learning partners only among those factions with whom I identify. I belong to millennial moms, I don't know. I seem to be saying internally sometimes that I belong to some group over another. I belong to college-educated folks, I don't know. But as Paul reminds us, None of these groups are anything, only Christ, who makes us grow. Who makes us all grow in the same garden together as God's field. And any over-identification with one group over another can lead to petty disagreements. I've been known to get a little too feisty when general, generational stereotypes about millennials are being thrown around, for example. Besides, the factions I tend to embrace can limit me, can prevent me from seeing how much I can learn and grow from surprising people. I mean, I was a sheltered, goody two-shoe student from birth to college graduation, but in some ways, I've never felt more belonging in a Christian community than when worshiping with the women in the Raleigh women's prison. And I'm not Catholic, but during seminary, a Catholic woman was one of the people who showed me what it really looks like to love Jesus and to plead for justice. And at my ordination service to ministry here at Grace four years ago, the support from my home church and denomination, which does not allow the ordination of women, brought me to tears. I felt them set aside divisions in order to honor the heart for Jesus that we all share, in order to all receive communion together. So even if I feel called to keep arguing passionately for the things I believe Jesus would argue passionately for, there's a lot more room in my life anyway to learn from and work with and most importantly love others who may not be in my chosen in-groups. 
Maybe some of this resonates with you too. Do you, do you assume your best friends and partners are people like you? Military families, people who have solar panels and electric vehicles, mission-focused Christians, Bible-focused Christians, or people who like the same hobbies you do. There may be some real content in some of these identities to explore and embrace, but also, can you believe that an army person might actually be able to learn about love from a navy person? Or a straight person from a queer one? That it's not even Bible studies or mission projects in the end, but God who makes us grow. That we might be called to love one another, to all band together sometimes, to, like this week where we pray and weep and act and give in light of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Because it turns out that if you let go of your assumptions and you, that you know exactly who's in which group or what they will think or what they will do or how they will help or not help, if you let go of that, you can experience the surprises of growth, and mutual love. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, back in Jerusalem, for example, in some surprising signs of growth, the various factions have banded together to accomplish some badly needed renovations in the past decade. And maybe it's none of the Christian groups at all, but a Muslim family that exemplifies bearing with one another in love in that place. It's a funny quirk of history that the agreement going back 500 years designated a Muslim family to protect and hold the keys to the church. Adib Judah now carries the cast iron key that has been passed down in his family for generations. Every morning, he passes off the key to Waji Nuseba, another man whose family was entrusted generations ago with the task of unlocking the door each morning and locking it up again each evening. Now, by a strict definition of unity as oneness, sameness, I suppose this arrangement could be viewed as yet another sign of division, compartmentalization, failure. But Judah has talked about how he finds his Muslim family's responsibility for a key to a Christian holy site to be an honor, a way to cultivate love and peace in the world and to be faithful to his own Islamic tradition. And so we all may be surprised if we open our eyes to those who can show us what bearing with one another in love looks like in our own lives. Amen.